witnesses from minor prophets. And I think the auction has taken its toll. I see the faithful elect of Israel are here. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> some people are money changing in the temple over there. So I don't know about that. <laughs> we do appreciate uh, seeing you here. We're coming this morning to uh, uh, the shortest of the uh, minor prophets, the most minor of them, I guess, in terms of length, uh, who is Obadiah. And I apologize, I didn't mention that last week uh, in the uh, uh, time we had together, and so I uh, mean to do that every week. Next week, uh, by the way, it'll be Hosea. Hosea, one of the most interesting um, R-rated stories in the Old Testament, uh, Hosea. So uh, you'll want to take a look at that. We'll probably focus on the first three chapters of uh, Hosea. So if you're wanting to look at it, and uh, it's about, I think it's 14 chapters long, but we'll be restricting our principal attention to the first uh, several chapters. So that will be next week. Something, something, something of a debate, really. Who came first? I'm more or less uh, giving you my opinion on that, uh, opinion based on you know, some research and reading, although I'm certainly not an expert on the subject. And then we have another uh, little clump of prophets that will come sometime later, uh, really more closely connected to the events leading up to the so-called Babylonian exile. And then we have what are called the post-exilic uh, prophets. Those are the prophets who really begin to be active after Israel returns uh, following the Babylonian exile. That's Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, those fellows. So right now we're in the first uh, little block of these, five of them. We've looked at three. Today's the fourth one, Obadiah. Uh, we've been looking at them more or less in reverse order. Uh, we uh, glanced, first of all, at the two prophets who are connected with the reign of Jeroboam in the north. Jeroboam the second. Really, he presides over the ten northern tribes during the time of their greatest ascendancy. Uh, we, one of these prophets comes at the beginning. That's uh, um, uh, Jonah, that we uh, looked at his story. Uh, he has a message both to the people of Israel, that God would bless them, but also a message to the Ninevites, as you know, uh, in a sense, settling them down, as it were, giving opportunity for Israel's growth that we looked at. But then, of course, in the midst of that growth and prestige and power and wealth, uh, the lightning bolt Amos comes right in the middle of it to call these people to an account, because rather than properly thanking God for all of his blessings, they had turned it in upon themselves and become self-sufficient, as Amos says, at ease in Zion. And uh, God was going to basically bring that to an abrupt end, which he did. And so those two prophets come during the reign of Jeroboam. Uh, Jonah the first, about 780, Amos 760. Next week we look at Hosea, who comes right at the end of the reign of Jeroboam, and so we'll be putting a little ribbon on that uh, story. But we've jumped back in time now to a prior time, about 50 years earlier. Last week we looked at Joel. Joel uh, comes on the scene about 820, so about 40 years earlier than Jonah. Joel is uh, in the midst of the reign of, of uh, Joash, and we talked a little bit about his uh, career. Joash had a great start, but then got a little fuzzy when the high priest Jehoiada, that had been such a major influence in his life, passed from the scene. Joash himself lost, apparently, some of his focus. And it was at that time when he was drifting, and the people of, his, of Judah with him, that Joel comes in to call them back, to call them to repent. And it seems that, uh, apparently, they did uh, have a little bit of a, a reshuffling there and a refocusing of their of their understanding, and so it seems that Joel had some uh, positive effect. Now, we're moving back even behind uh, Joel this morning to Obadiah. Obadiah, maybe, at least by my reckoning, uh, will be the first in the midst of the reign of a king whose name is Jehoram. And so we'll be looking at uh, him, and then, as I say, next week, jump back. We'll pick up Hosea and then uh, press on from there. So anyway, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get underway. Father, we're grateful once again for this opportunity that you've given us to gather around your word. And as we look at this particular prophet who admittedly tends to be neglected, Obadiah, but we want to hear his message and see how those things that he had for the people of his day 
can also apply to us. We pray that we would hear your voice and your word as we seek to come to terms with this great message. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I apologize. I know I'm a little bit hoarse here. I'm not in any pain, no acute distress, just a little bit hoarse in the, in the throat. So uh, if you can bear with me, uh, we'll do okay. Probably reigned for about 40 years, then David, then Solomon. That was the United Kingdom. Then they split. The ten northern tribes, of course, under Jeroboam, set up an independent monarchy. Uh, the house of David, the dynasty of David, continues in the southern kingdom, uh, centered in Jerusalem. So the, uh, the uh, successor then to Solomon is, is Rehoboam, his son. That's followed by Abijah, who has kind of a mixed review, but seems to have done uh, reasonably well. And then Asa, A-S-A, he's a good king, reigns for a long time, followed by his son, Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat also gets very good reviews. Uh, Jehoshaphat is... Um, um, uh, has a lengthy reign, and at least uh, generally speaking, the description of him uh, presents him as a very good king who accomplished many good things. The only really dark cloud on the horizon with respect to Jehoshaphat was, num number one, he did a miserable job raising his son, Jehoram, who was the next king on the uh, uh, throne of Judah. And he seems to have had an unusually close relationship with probably the most wicked king that ever reigned in Israel, the ten northern tribes, whose name was Ahab. Uh, you know the name Ahab, of course. Uh, he's famous because of uh, the pro prophecy of Elijah. Uh, Ahab was not only uh, really uh, of uh, pretty uh, doubtful character himself, but he was married to Jezebel. And Jezebel, of course, distinguishes herself as probably the most wicked woman in the history of uh, the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, to this day, the name Jezebel uh, has a, a ring to it that uh, makes it, you know, not, not the first name usually parents think of naming their little girls, Jezebel. We just don't usually think in those terms because it has such a reputation. So, you've got Ahab and Jezebel, contemporaries of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's a good king, but he does hang out it seems a little bit with Ahab. We're not quite sure why. They have a couple of treaties they enter and some joint ventures they engage in. And, you know, so there it is. And it, it raises a certain little uh, question about him, which really culminated in the fact that the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, whose name was Athaliah, was given in marriage to the son of Jehoshaphat, whose name was Jehoram. And so Jehoram, who is the king of whom we're most interested right now, is married to Athaliah, and she herself is the daughter of this wicked couple, Ahab and, uh, and Jezebel. And so uh, that probably didn't represent much of a good influence for Jehoram. Uh, Jehoshaphat dies. Uh, Jehoram takes the throne, married to Athaliah, and uh, his entire career is really deplorable. He is the first king that really gets truly negative reviews, very negative reviews in the Old Testament. We'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, early in his reign, there is a, uh, um, an invasion of uh, Israel. We'll take a quick look at that. He dies after eight years. So he takes the throne in 848. He dies in 840. He is succeeded by the one-year reign of his son, Ahaziah, dies just after one year, and then Athaliah seizes the throne, usurps the throne in Judah, and is the only female monarch then in the history of either of the kingdoms. She reigns for six years. We covered that last week, but repetition is the hallmark of education. Remember that, so I'm telling you this again. Uh, and then in 835, of course, she is deposed in a palace coup, and Joash, the young son who had been hidden, the grandson really of Athaliah and Jehoram, is now brought to Israel at seven years old, becomes the king, and then it's during his reign that Joel has his prophecy. So that hopefully is just one more time getting it in your mind. So now we're, we're in the reign of uh, Jehoram. As we look at this uh, book of Obadiah, we notice that his principal concern, however, is not with the people of Judah. Uh, he is another of these prophets who's principally focused on a foreign nation. Now, I indicated to you a few weeks ago that Jonah is the only uh, prophet who actually has a principal mission, as it were, to a foreign nation. He's sent to Nineveh. 
No other prophet has that. But some of them have messages that are designed to highlight a foreign nation, and that would be the case with Obadiah. The foreign nation in whom he is principally interested is Edom, Edom, E-D-O-M, to the south, uh, just south of Judah, in really the Judean wilderness there between Judah and uh, Egypt. Edom is a name you probably recognize. Uh, Edom has considerable play in the Old Testament, not simply in Obadiah, but many other places. Edom is another name for Esau. Esau, as you know, is the twin brother of Jacob. So we have Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, his son Isaac, and then Isaac marries Rebekah, and they have twin sons, uh, fraternal twins, presumably, Jacob and Esau. Uh, you know, Jacob and Esau had a rather tense relationship. Uh, Jacob stole his birthright, you know, tricked him out of his blessing, and otherwise uh, uh, sort of pulled some fast ones on Esau. And Esau was about ready to, you know, string him up, uh, literally, and Jacob ran for his life. And uh, then when they finally reconciled, it was a reconciliation of sorts, but not really any, any kind of true deep friendship. And that hostility between Jacob and, and Esau continued in their subsequent um, uh, lineage. In other words, the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau maintained a kind of ongoing hostility between them. And we see this showing up repeatedly in the Old Testament. It's one of the most remarkable and consistent motifs in the Old Testament, how the Edomites play and various uh, tribal groups within the Edomites. On one occasion, Moses wants to go through Edomite territory during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and the king of Edom says, no way, uh, and refuses them, even though they should, they're cousins. They should have some kind of you know, fraternal relationship, but nothing doing. Uh, and so the Edomites uh, are, uh, are, are in this hostile relationship. Saul, the king, you recall, the first king of uh, Judah, is supposed to go to war against the Amalekites, if you remember that, Amalek. He, that's, a, that's a tribe within Edom. And uh, that uh, happens to be the beginning of the end for Saul, because he didn't carry out his responsibilities there as he was supposed to. Uh, the Edomites were eventually subjected by David and Solomon and their successors for a certain period of time, but as we're going to see today, they rebel during the reign of Jehoram, and that may be what precipitates this uh, prophecy from Obadiah. But the tension continues. Psalm 137, uh, which is a, uh, a psalm coming out of the exile, it's a wonderful psalm uh, that you might want to read later, but it, uh, it mentions the Edomites who were just rejoicing when Jerusalem was destroyed. And they were encouraging, like cheerleaders, the Babylonians who were wiping out Jerusalem. Raise it! Raise it to the ground! That's the line in Psalm 137. And so you can see all the way through the uh, Edomites continue to play a kind of a provocative role. They're never major enemies themselves, but it's like they're always encouraging other people to go in and just, you know, create havoc for the people of God in Judah. And that's, that's really the role they seem to play. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, uh, highlights right off the bat the difference between uh, Esau and Jacob. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Uh, that very startling line that starts right off. Paul picks that up, of course, in, Ro in Romans chapter 9. The tension between Jacob and Edom actually continues into the New Testament. And it really culminates in a New Testament drama. And so now let me give you a little pop quiz here. Who is the most famous Edomite in the New Testament? Shout it out. Anybody know? <laughs> Herod. So Herod is the culmination of that whole Edomite tradition. There is a great deep root in the Old Testament that kind of hits the fan in the New Testament when ultimately Herod tries to destroy Messiah. That represents an unfolding drama throughout the really thousands of years 
of the Old Testament. And so, you know, people that, if you know your Old Testament, then you appreciate there's a whole lot happening when uh, Herod wants to, you know, take the throne from Messiah. That's really finishing off a story that's been unfolding for a long time. So, uh, that, the whole Herodian dynasty, Herod and his seven, his six sons, all seven of them all together, uh, really finish off the story then of the Edomites. All right. Uh, well, here we're looking at uh, probably the earliest, well, not the earliest, but, well, the earliest uh, minor prophet, I'll say that. And uh, one of the earlier expressions then of this, this tension between uh, um, the Edomites on the one hand and uh, uh, the people of God on the other. To introduce this, what I'd like to do is have you, if, if, you're, if you're in Obadiah, by the way, the main challenge with Obadiah is finding it. Uh, and so, uh, if, uh, if you'd like a little help here, it's page 858. It is a short book, 21 verses. So, we'll be able to easily make it through the entire book this morning. Uh, so, if you'd like to find that, first of all, then put your finger right there uh, on 858. But I want to actually refer us back to 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 21. 2 Chronicles 21. And we're going to put this into its historical context a little bit more uh, by reading briefly a little bit from this chapter. <clears throat> so uh, keep your finger there with Obadiah. Uh, turn back. This is page 404, by the way. 2 Chronicles chapter 21. And uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look here. Jehoshaphat slept with his ancestors and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. This is Jehoshaphat I mentioned earlier. Uh, his son Jehoram succeeded him. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, and those brothers are ticked off here, named uh, individually. Verse 3, their father gave them many gifts, gave all these brothers uh, many gifts of silver, gold, and valuable possessions together with the fortified cities of Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram. Because that was his firstborn son. So following the principle of promogenitor, which is the firstborn gets the major blessing, in this case Jehoram, the firstborn son, receives the kingdom. That was probably not very smart on Jehoshaphat's part. Uh, he probably had more honorable sons that he could have chosen among, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Jehoram is the one. When Jehoram had ascended the throne of his father and was established, he put all his brothers to the sword and also some of the officials of Israel. So now Jehoram's true colors come out big time. Uh, he uh, immediately secures his station there by wiping out all his brothers. And uh, if anyone doubted, you know, his integrity or, or character, uh, that certainly made it very clear. This is not something that was, that was certainly practiced commonly in the ancient Near East. Oriental despots tended to do this commonly. You see it in Persia, uh, you see it in uh, uh, um, Assyria, you see it in other uh, of the ancient Near Eastern civilizations. But it is never tolerated, never condoned, always condemned in the, among the people of Israel and Judah. And so what Jehoram here is not unusual in his culture, but very unusual and not permitted among the people of God. He wipes out all his brothers to secure the throne for himself. Verse 5, Jehoram was 32 years old when he began to reign. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. Fairly short reign and uh, very rocky, uh, mainly because of his own uh, lack of integrity here. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife. That's Athaliah we mentioned. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he made with David, since he had promised to give him a lamp to his descendants forever. And that, of course, is the great Davidic promise that finally culminates in Messiah himself, the son of David. All right, now our interest picks up at verse 8. In his days, Edom revolted against the rule of Judah and set up a king of their own. I had mentioned to you earlier, but Jehoram now is treated with a revolt from the Edomites, and they set up a king of their own. Verse 9, Then Jehoram crossed over with his commanders and all his chariots. He set out by night and attacked the Edomites, who had surrounded him and his chariot commanders. It's an oblique verse, but the bottom line is he tried to recover the Edomites and failed. Uh, so they established their independence and were able to maintain it. Uh, then verse 10, so Edom has been in revolt against the rule of Judah to this day, to the day of the writing of uh, Second Chronicles, which was obviously some years later. 
At that time, Libna also revolted against his rule because he'd forsaken the Lord, the God of his ancestors. Now, the next little section there, if you're using the Pew Bible, you'll see it says Elijah's letter. Elijah is a contemporary of Ahab and a contemporary of Jehoram, writes a letter that just sizzles uh, with uh, heat uh, and warning to Jehoram because of the way in which he's beginning his rule. And uh, we won't read this, but Elijah basically says to him, uh, you know, you're going the wrong direction and because of this, God is going to bring judgment upon you. He's going to bring judgment on you in terms of your rule. He's going to bring judgment on you in terms of your health. And you're going to be inflicted with a gruesome disease, which is going to, you know, take your life, a uh, d- devastating disease of the bowels, it's said to be. And uh, so he dies a very unhappy death, just a few years hence. Let's drop down to verse 16. The Lord aroused against Jehoram the anger of the Philistines and of the Arabs who are near the Ethiopians. They came up against Judah, invaded it, and carried away all the possessions they found that belonged to the king's house, along with his sons and his wives, so that no son was left except Jehoahaz, his youngest son. Now, this is a major invasion related to Egypt and Ethiopia, uh, and that seems to have happened just after the revolt of the Edomites. So, if we just put a quick chronology here, Jehoram takes the throne in four in, in 848. The revolt probably is about 846 uh, of Edom, and then this invasion probably 845, 844. This all happened rather in rapid succession, representing something of God's judgment against Jehoram because of his uh, wayward ways. Uh, and then. Verse 18 wraps it up. Uh, After this, God struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease. Now, if you were junior hires, you'd love this, you know. But uh, in the course of time, at the end of two years, his bowels came out. Ooh, cool. I I can just hear them saying, oh, well. And uh, he died in great agony. Uh, His people uh, made no fire in his honor like the fires made for his ancestors. He was 32 years old when he began to reign. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He departed to no one's regret. Uh, They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Jehoram just gets no good news about him whatsoever. And that's his very unhappy demise. So we have this, uh, this period of time here. All right. Well, now, if you're living in Jerusalem at that time, you not only are not very impressed with your king Jehoram, but you're also very distressed at the uh, the devastating effects of this invasion that's just taken place and the role that's been played by Edom. And uh, the book of Obadiah seems to come right in the midst of that moment. Now, again, let me give this little caveat. Obadiah does not date himself. He doesn't say, you know, in the reign of uh, Jehoram, the word of the Lord came to Obadiah and such and so. He doesn't give us uh, any distinct uh, idea when he wrote this book. Uh, And so commentators, as you can imagine, are all over the radar screen. They'll put him very early, very late. I'm going with a fairly early date. I'm deeply indebted to the commentators uh, uh, Kale and Delich, if you know those names, they're, they're extraordinarily good, and they make just a compelling argument, convinces me that, uh, that the, the date should go earlier. It seems that uh, folks that want to put Obadiah later have a, an agenda going on that's not really just driven by what the text actually says. And so I'm going to follow those two great scholars and, and uh, concur with them for our purposes that Obadiah shows up right in the midst of this time, uh, which is triggered really by this uh, uh, involvement with Edom. All right, so we're going to put him at about the year 840, 20 years earlier than Joel, who was 820. Uh, Just for round numbers, you can kind of stick that in your mind as a benchmark for Obadiah. Just toward the tail end, then, of the the, uh, reign of Jehoram. Okay, so let's look at this. We're on page uh, 858, uh, Obadiah, and uh, let's uh, see what he has to say. The vision of Obadiah. The word, by the way, uh, Obadiah, um, the um, name means servant of Yahweh. And so that's a good name, of course, for this uh, individual, servant of Yahweh. Uh, Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. 
So immediately he gives us a heads up that the recipient, at least the interest that he has in this book, is Edom. Uh, Edom, as I say, really centered in what's called Mount Seir, which is to the south of Judah, a rocky region, um, very uh, impenetrable in many ways, uh, famous for its mountains. The city of Petra was there. Uh, it was uh, considered to be kind of rough and difficult to penetrate, and so the Edomites viewed themselves as somewhat secure. There were caves. There were all kinds of protected little places there. It reminds me of, we've heard in recent months about Afghanistan. It was similar kind of, of a terrain with a lot of caves and, and uh, forbidding kind of, uh, of uh, uh, terrain. So anyway, that, that's, that was basically true of the uh, region of Edom. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a report from the Lord, and a message has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise up against it for battle. This is uh, a message now that's coming to Obadiah, and it is as if he, it's as if he's saying here, there's a rumor spreading among the nations about a rising up against Edom. Edom has, as it were, risen up against the people of God, but now there's going to be a kind of payback time. This is sort of the, the tone with which this starts. I will surely make you the least among the nations, you shall be utterly despised. The wealth of the uh, center of worship there in Jerusalem, a lot of that is looted and plundered. And so that's a big deal. This is huge. And the, the apparent role that was played by the Edomites was kind of standing back and encouraging all of this. The Edomites remind me, if I can be a little bit silly about it, like a younger brother who needles and torments his older brother, but always stays just out of reach, you know. And as soon as he's about to get it, he runs for protection to mom. You can never quite get to him. He's always just, that, you know, that kind of uh, uh, testy little kid that's just never strong enough to take you on, you know, straight up in a fair fight, but just always tormenting from the, from the edges. That's kind of the role that Edom seems to play, except much more serious. They encourage the others who come in and have these, uh, uh, you know, devastating, uh, you know, uh, sort of play in the life of, of Judah, but they never do it directly themselves. They just encourage the others. And so that seems to be the role that uh, Edom is described in. Uh, so the, uh, the, the word back to them then from Obadiah, I will make you the least of the nations. God's judgment was going to come upon them for the way in which they had really neglected what should have been their proper role. They should not only have been tormenting uh, Judah, they should have been helping. This is their brother, uh, for goodness sakes. Your proud heart has deceived you. You that dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose dwelling is in the heights, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? The, uh, the, uh, the region, as I indicated, of uh, Edom was rocky, and they took pride in it, like they were out of touch. Uh, they're living in these clefts of the rock. Their dwelling is in the heights. They say, who can bring us down to the ground? And so they are undercover, as it were. They can uh, be in a safe location, and from that location feel somewhat uh, uh, protected from any reprisals as they engage in this negative behavior toward Judah. And yet the warning that Obadiah is giving them is that's not going to last forever. That their, their uh, role that they've been playing here with, uh, with Judah is going to be fed back to them, as it were, onto, onto their own heads. Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. This did happen. Uh, Edom did revolt, as we said, uh, but they, in fact, did face the music themselves sometime not too long in the future after these events, particularly at the hands of the Assyrians, and then, re and then again in the hands of the Babylonians, and, uh, and so on. And so their cozy kind of confidence here was brought to a rapid uh, and reversal, you see, within uh, some later period of time. But right now they're feeling very um, kind of uh, secure and uh, out of reach. 
Uh, now, just how bad is it going to be? Uh, Obadiah uses an interesting kind of image here to describe just how complete is this devastation going to be when the Edomites are exposed to this uh, assault from outside. If thieves came to you, he says, if plunderers by night, how you might have been, dis- uh, how you've been destroyed, would they not, uh, would they not steal only what they wanted? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? A simple image, really. He's, he's simply saying, you know, if you're burgled, if your house is uh, subjected to uh, some kind of thievery, usually the burglar won't take everything you've got. Uh, rather, the burglar goes in and takes the easy stuff, you know, grabs the VCR, and, you know, whatever, and makes it out the back window, and you're still left with a lot of your things. They just, they just grab the easy plunder, as it were. Or if someone's going to rob your vineyard, they don't try to pick every grape. But they just take the stuff that's easy to get. That's the picture here. And Obadiah is saying, that's what people normally do. But, in the case of you, Edom, it's going to be much worse. Uh, Verse 6, how Esau has been pillaged and your treasures searched out. So even though you think you're safe, even though you think you're protected, uh, by the time this is over, all of your... Uh, you know, plunder is going, all of your riches are going to be gone, looted, searched out, uh, disappear. So it's a, it's a, it's a very startling kind of uh, um, description of the judgment that would come upon the Edomites uh, for the way that they had behaved. All your allies have deceived you. They've driven you to the border. Your confederates have prevailed against you. Those that ate your bread have set a trap for you. There's no understanding of it. Uh, so the allies that the Edomites thought they could rely upon, there's several tribal groups there, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, various others. They all kind of formed a coalition that uh, gave them all a certain degree of security, so they thought, against uh, what may have been happening in Israel or in Judah. Uh, but all of these are going to reverse themselves, and Edom is going to be left twisting in the wind, as it were, is the, is the picture that's drawn. Um, Down to verse 8. On that day, says the Lord, I will destroy the wise out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau. Uh, Edom had played this role of provoking and tormenting and mocking the people of Judah, but they weren't going to get away with it. God, who is a God of justice, would bring back upon their own heads in some subsequent set of events uh, the very thing that they'd been dishing out. And the book, of Eda, uh, the book of Obadiah is really intended to, you know, call our attention, first of all, to that. Beyond that, of course, what it says, uh, you know, the, the lesson we learn from it, uh, just uh, in passing here, is that God is not mocked. Uh, this is a theme that runs all the way through the scriptures. Uh, Paul says to the Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. You know, the Hindus recognize this and called it karma. But I think the Bible gives a much better explanation for it. It's simply that God is not going to be made a fool of. If we mock his law, if we disregard the standards that he's planted in each one of us for righteous behavior, you know, ultimately there's going to be a payback time. That that's just the way the universe operates. If we sow to the flesh, corruption will reap from the flesh. That kind of destruction. If we sow to the spirit, then we'll reap from the spirit life. That's Paul's words in in Galatians. All right, verse 10. For the slaughter and violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, you Edomites. You will be cut off forever. Which really did happen, of course. You know, you think, uh, one, it's a remarkable thing. We, we still have Jewish people among us, don't we? There may be Jewish people in the sanctuary today. Uh, who knows? But, but uh, you know, we, we certainly know that the folks are out there who are members of the Jewish faith and Jewish people ethnically and so on. When was the last time you met an Edomite? You, know. you see, uh, one of the most remarkable things, that many of these, uh, you know, just disappear from the radar screen. And the Edomites are one of them. They, they, they make it till the first century and end of the story. And so uh, Obadiah's warning to them is that it's only a matter of time. You will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aside, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were like one of them. You who should have been rising to the defense of your brother, your cousins here, you were like one of these people casting lots for the 
riches of Jerusalem. And now this, uh, this next three verses are just powerful. I can almost see Obadiah shaking his finger here. Uh, listen to what he says. Verse 12. You should not have gloated over your brother on the day of his misfortune. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah on the day of their ruin. You should not have boasted on the day of distress. You shouldn't have done that. You know, gloating. That's the first level of bad behavior. They were gloating. Actually, the Hebrew words mean staring, gazing. We have a tendency, of course, to gaze at misfortune. It's a human thing. We teach children, don't stare, because we know it's impolite uh, to do that, uh, to look at people, particularly when they're the victims of catastrophe. We have this almost irresistible urge to do so. But how much worse it is when we gaze with a gloating stare, when my enemy sustains a catastrophe and I smugly, proudly gaze at them. You know, how much worse that is. And that's exactly what the Edomites are described as doing. This is, uh, you know, beneath the dignity of, uh, of any uh, responsible behavior. And yet that's what they're accused of here. You should not have done that. Uh, Obadiah says, you should not have entered the gate of my people on the day of their calamity. You should not have joined in gloating over Judah's disaster on the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods on the day of his calamity. This is the next step. They not only gloated, gazing, but they actually participated in this invasion. Not the leaders. They were more the, they were the kind of parasites. They came in in the wake of this great invasion and just were kind of grabbing stuff, you know, here and there, looting. Uh, but, uh, but again, they were uh, uh, kind of encouraging all of this. Verse 14, you should not have stood at the crossings to cut off his fugitives. You should not have handed over his survivors on the day of his distress. This is very fundamental stuff. I mean, I, you know, I'm not suggesting to you that this is... Uh, you know, deep, uh, you know, overwhelming theology. This is like basic stuff that, like that book that says, everything I ever knew, I, important I learned in kindergarten. That, this is where we should learn this stuff, you know. Uh, this is, this is uh, Obadiah saying, uh, you're not supposed to behave this way. This is not the way you should be acting. And God is going to bring back upon your own head reprisal for the way in which you were behaving. This last item here is uh, is interesting. The Edomites, as we say, were to the south of Judah. That was the natural place where refugees escaped. When things got bad in Jerusalem, they would naturally run south. And we see that many times in the scriptures. The threat tended to come from the north, escape to the south. Even the Holy Family, Jacob, or, uh, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, you recall, during the uh, threat from, uh, from Herod, went south to uh, Egypt, and that kind of thing you find many times. Well, here, people tried to escape to the south, but the Edomites, rather than facilitating the escape of these refugees, rather than helping them, stand there barring the way. So, verse 14, you should not have stood at the crossings to cut off the fugitives. These people trying to escape from Jer Jerusalem, you stop them, you throw them right back into the lion's den. You see, what kind of inhuman treatment is this that you're dishing out to these from Jerusalem. Okay, verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. That's probably the main lesson from Obadiah for us. Uh, the way we live, the way we dish out, is the way it's dished back. This is, you know, this is, again, is not deep theology. This is simple stuff. But it's one of those lessons we probably need to hear it from time to time. Uh, there's old sayings about be careful who you step on on your way up the ladder, you know, because you're going to meet them on the way back down. That's the idea here. These things, uh, you know, when you've uh, dished it out this way, it'll come right back on your own head. A kind of poetic justice that God has built into the nature of things, and Obadiah reminds them of it. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, all the nations around you shall drink. That is to drink you down, as it were. You reveled, you partied on Jerusalem's misfortune right there in her holy mountain, but the time is coming when you will be drunk down, as it were, by those that you thought you could rely on. All right, up to verse 17. 
But on Mount Zion, this is the, the, these last few verses now represent God's great promise to his people. Uh, that although Edom was going to sustain God's discipline, uh, nevertheless, God's people under his protection would be uh, given his grace and mercy. And these last few verses uh, just point this out to us. But on Mount Zion there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall take possession of those who dispossess them. Even though they're going through a difficult time and more will come, nevertheless God will protect them and bring them back. The house of Jacob, that is the two southern tribes, will be a fire. The house of Joseph, the ten northern tribes, a flame. This is a way of saying God's blessing would rest upon them. He would reinstate them to the land. Edom, on the other hand, Esau, stubble, you see. Uh, they shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. This is a hard, uh, hard book. I mean, he's, he's hard, he's harsh, he's, you know, this is the way it is. Edom is uh, going to deal with the, uh, the uh, wrath of God for the way that they've behaved here. Those of the Negev, that means the south, shall possess Mount Esau. This is all describing God reinstating his people to the land. Uh, those of Shafila, that means the lowlands around the Dead Sea region, presumably the land of the Philistines. He's going around the points of the compass, so the south, now the west. Uh, those of, um, uh, verse 19, they shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, that'd be the north, and Benjamin shall uh, possess Gilead, that's the east. So all of this is saying that God's going to bring his people back into the land. They will possess it. Edom itself will be under the possession of Judah. God's going to bless them. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, a promise that runs throughout the scriptures of God's promise to care for his people. The exiles of the Israelites who were in Hala shall possess Phoenicia as far as Zarephath. Those are regions up in the northwest in what the Tyre and Sidon and Phoenicia, that region. Um, and the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in Shepharad, uh, shall possess the towns of the Negev. I don't know why the translators, many of these words could have been translated. Uh, I think the, uh, the translators left them in their Hebrew, uh, which makes it harder to read, but these are like Negev, simply means south. Uh, those who have been saved shall go up to Mount Zion and shall rule Mount Esau. So the promise here to God's people is that ultimately they would be cared for and that even Edom, in spite of its moment of gloating, was ultimately going to be brought within God's discipline. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So there we are. That's Obadiah. Um, uh, what do we learn from Obadiah? Well, we learn, number one, what goes around comes around. You know? Be careful how you live. With the measure you meet it out, it'll be measured to you again. That's, that's one great uh, message that we have here. And that's just practical stuff. That's, you know, I think we can all take that to heart, heart and think about that every day of the week. What do we learn from Obadiah? We learn that God is gracious to his people. That uh, even though from time to time we, you know, deal with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that uh, may come our way, nevertheless, God in his grace protects us and cares for us. Sometimes we go through painful circumstances. Sometimes we may go through circumstances where we are abused or misunderstood or mistreated uh, as the Edomites mistreated the people of God. But that never escapes God's notice. And Jesus himself says to us, if we are persecuted for righteousness sake, then we should certainly rejoice in that. Because we know that God is pleased to bless his people when they with integrity withstand misunderstanding, uh, when they, when they you know, put up with uh, uh, unwarranted abuse. Uh, what, what do we learn from Obadiah? We learn that God was going to protect his people in many cases in spite of them. Jehoram was an evil king. Nevertheless, God was determined to protect these people and see it through to the culmination, the great moment of history when Jesus himself would come. And he was going to protect in spite many times of wayward behavior on the part of uh, his people. And I'm sure that there's many other lessons that we learn from Obadiah, but those uh, uh, come to my mind. And... All right, thank you. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we are grateful for Obadiah. We thank you for his courage. We thank you for the things that we learn from him. We thank you that you are not a God who is mocked and that you call us to uh, do those good things that come across our path. We know that you've said that the person that gives to the poor lends to the Lord. 
that even the tiniest thing, even a cup of cold water given in the name of Christ, is not unnoticed uh, by you. And so we pray that we would be those who find ways to not behave as the Edomites did, but really to uh, exemplify the very character of Christ. Mm-hmm.